Epistemology is the branch of philosophy that studies knowledge. It asks questions like, what is knowledge? What do we know? How do we know it? Philosophers since Plato have commonly assumed that there are three conditions which are individually necessary and jointly sufficient for knowledge. In order to know something, it has to be a justified true belief. Let me explain each of these conditions in opposite order. First, knowledge requires belief. This condition is pretty straightforward. The idea is that you don't actually know something if you don't believe it. If you don't believe that Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, then you don't know that Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. Second, knowledge requires truth. Again, this is fairly intuitive. Just because I believe something doesn't mean I know it. The belief also has to be true. So even if I believe that 2 plus 2 equals 10, it doesn't make sense to say that I know that 2 plus 2 equals 10. My belief is false. Even if I think that I know that 2 plus 2 equals 10, and no matter how sure I may be of it, I don't know it. So only my true beliefs count as knowledge. Third, knowledge requires justification. Even if my beliefs are true, they don't count as knowledge unless I have good reasons for holding these beliefs, good grounds, a rational basis for holding those beliefs. Let's say, for example, that I buy a lottery ticket. Millions of other people have also bought lottery tickets. Because I'm a hopeless optimist, I just start believing my ticket is going to win. Obviously, my belief is irrational. The odds are millions to one that my ticket is not going to win. Obvi um, but let's say that my ticket actually is the winning ticket in this case. My belief was true. Would you say, therefore, that I knew that my ticket was the winner? Many philosophers would say, no, I didn't have real knowledge that my ticket would win. It was just a lucky guess. Even a broken clock is right twice a day. But that true belief doesn't count as knowledge because it had no justification. It was an irrational, groundless belief. So in order to count as knowledge, our beliefs must not merely be true, but also justified. Much of the debate in epistemology centers, therefore, on two questions. First, what standards do our beliefs have to meet in order to count as justified, as rational, as warranted? And secondly, which of our beliefs actually are justified and which of our beliefs are unjustified? These two questions are closely related. If you set a very high standard for justification, then fewer of our beliefs are going to count as justified and hence fewer of our beliefs will count as things that we really know. On the other hand, if you lower the standard for justification, then more of our beliefs will count as knowledge. For example, Descartes says in his first meditation that we should only assent to beliefs that are absolutely certain and indubitable, indubit that means undoubtable. That's a very high standard for justification. And it turns out that our ordinary sensory beliefs in external objects can't meet that standard, according to Descartes in Meditation 1. So we don't know whether an external world exists. John Locke disagrees with Descartes' standard for justification. He thinks that we are justified in holding beliefs that are probably true, even if they aren't absolutely certain. Locke thinks that our ordinary sensory beliefs in external objects can meet this standard so we can know that an external world exists. So the advantage of having a lower standard for justification is that it avoids skepticism. Now a skeptic is someone who denies that we have knowledge of a certain kind, a certain kind of claim. Descartes at the end of the first meditation is a skeptic about virtually everything from the existence of the external world to simple truths of arithmetic. But Locke avoids this skeptical dilemma. But the advantage of having a high standard for justification is that you avoid holding false beliefs. Let's say you set a very low standard for justification and you say, belief in a claim is justified if that claim has been made on the internet. Well, if you believe everything that you read on the internet, you'll end up believing lots and lots of true things. But you'll also end up believing lots and lots of false things. So the advantage of a position like Descartes is that if you limit yourself to justify beliefs, you're more likely to avoid error. The downside is that you might not let yourself hold many true beliefs either. 
So these are the questions that I want you to wrestle with in this unit. What standards do our beliefs have to meet in order to be justified? And which of our beliefs really do meet that standard? In this unit, we're going to focus on two kinds of beliefs in particular. The first is our sensory beliefs in external physical objects. So right now, you're, hearing a, you're having a visual perception of a computer screen, and you've got an audio sensation of my voice. You probably believe that there is really a computer in front of you. It's not just a hallucination or a dream. The computer isn't just in your mind. It's in the external world. But is your belief justified? Rene Descartes and George Barclay will say that it's not. John Locke will say that it is. Second, we'll examine our belief in inductive arguments. You probably believe that if you drop a pencil right now in midair, it will fall to the floor. It won't float around the room. Why do you believe that? Well, because all the objects you've ever dropped have fallen to the ground instead of floating in midair. But uh, that means that you've made an inductive inference about the effects of dropping objects based on your previous observations. The question is, are those inductive inferences justified? David Hume will give us some reasons to question whether they are.